Hello and welcome to Between the Rows. I'm your host this week, Dave Bedard. You can expect to hear a lot more in the not-too-distant future about cybersecurity on the farm and the role that farmers can play in helping to tighten up the agriculture sector's digital safety net. We'll be talking to the lead investigator on a new project looking at where the gaps are and what we can do collectively to come up with some solutions. We should see a greater level of collective awareness and engagement, uh, you know, including among industry, policy, public safety, and national security. Statistics Canada has just put out its first estimates of what all of you are planning to see this spring and how much. It isn't enough uh, because of the fact that we've seen such strong demand for canola and it's the reason prices are as high as they are, uh, but it does make it a challenge for next year. All this coming up on Between the Rows after this. Thanks for calling the crop guru. Yeah, I'm wondering about increasing yield and return with optimal P and K applications. Oh, uh, reply hazy, try again. Okay, I also need a nutrient removal calculator. Cannot predict now. Hold on, are you using a magic eight ball? Uh, signs point to yes. Get less guessing and more data. Expert research, advice, and soil management tools are available for free at Nutrien Economics. That's Nutrien-Economics.com. It's no secret that the business of farming is going increasingly online, and just recently the federal government announced funding for a campaign to help assess the state of cybersecurity across Canada's agriculture sector and promote cybersecurity across the sector as well. The campaign is called, appropriately enough, the Cybersecurity Capacity in Canadian Agriculture Project, and spearheading it is a Saskatoon-based organization called the Community Safety Knowledge Alliance. Janosch Bochner is the CSKA's lead investigator down east in Guelph, and he joins us now. Dr. Bochner, hi, and welcome to Between the Rows. Hello, Dave. It's great to be with you today, and uh, very appreciative of the, of the interest of Glacier Farm Media in our work, uh, as well as uh, grateful for the support of Public Safety Canada. Well, you're very welcome. And uh, first, I'd like to talk a bit about the, uh, the Community Safety Knowledge Alliance and its mission and uh, where cybersecurity fits into that. You bet. So uh, CSKA is a Canadian uh, nonprofit that supports governments and others in developing, implementing and assessing new kinds of approaches to community safety and well-being. So, you know, we do this in a variety of ways. Some of these include mobilizing, bringing together and facilitating research, as well as new knowledge development on community safety and well-being. And we do this in collaboration with, you know, communities, industry, government, research and tech organizations, as well as academia. So, you know, uh, why our involvement in this project? Well, you know, there's a, a, a natural direct line of sight between uh, the security and well-being of the ag sector uh, and the safety and security and well-being of, of uh, you know, farm families and communities. Mm -hmm. So really put simply, uh, cyber attacks are another kind of event that harms businesses, families and the prosperity of communities. And we, we do hear a lot about cybersecurity in, in general terms these days, but why was agriculture identified as a specific sector at risk for the, for the purposes of this project? Yeah, thanks. Great question. So the short answer is that ag food is, is a little bit newer to digital technologies than other sectors are, but it may end up, you know, moving towards digitalization faster than the others have had to. So this, along with a rapidly evolving landscape of cyber crime and cyber disruptions, is, is expanding the number of risks a sector may have to face at an earlier stage of adoption and uh, cybersecurity maturity. And, and if I unpack this a little bit, you know, there, there are four main things that we're, we're noticing. One is that, you know, certainly uh, ag is one of the most important sectors of the Canadian economy. You know, it contributes to the livelihoods of millions of people, mm -hmm. along with the vitality and well-being of our rural communities. So its security uh, in the cyber area is really important and consequential. Uh, the Advisory Council on Economic Growth proposed that an important way to achieve its ambitious 21st century recommendations would be by Canada becoming the most trusted source globally of safe and sustainably produced food, uh, as well as, you know, doing our part around sustainable development goals. So again, you can see why um, focusing on how uh, the ag sector is going to be able to do this and enabling them to do that in a safe and secure way is going to be really important. The second piece is is the Canadian ag food sector 
you know, like those around the world is in the midst of a transformation involving its role on a global scale and the nature and practices of primary production. So like other producers, Canadians are striving to, to enhance their productivity and efficiency and the profitability of their operations. And they're doing this through a variety of new processes, practices, and technologies. These are often known by terms like smart farming, precision agriculture, and sometimes Ag 4.0. And then the third piece is the Ag food system is in its own way as important a critical infrastructure for Canada as more traditional systems like the power grid, water supply, telecommunications, and the workings of the financial services sector. But it hasn't developed the same level the others have in relation to cyber risk management protection and resilience. And then the last piece here really is that, you know, there are multiple connections within the ag food sector and between the sector and other critical infrastructures. These have been created through digital technologies, communications, and also overlapping supply chains. These are together driving really important efficiencies, but they also represent what some people call uh, an expanded threat landscape. In other words, there are more and more points of opportunity to cause disruptions. Where lots of these interdependencies exist, a disruption of one or two components can have a bunch of knock-on impacts on the others. In other words, risks and impacts can be amplified. So when you put all of this together, it represents uh, a great deal of promise for Canadians and for the Canadian economy, and also um, if not managed carefully, a bunch of risks that, uh, you know, so far haven't uh, been a prominent part of this particular conversation, but really deserve to be. Mm-hmm. I'd, li- I'd like to talk about some of those risks as well, but uh, yeah. I, I do find it interesting in terms of uh, infrastructure that, uh, you know, agriculture is certainly expanding its use of, uh, of, of online and online technology and, and, and digital tech generally, you know, it's, it's access to high speed and broadband is still somewhat dodgy, you know, in, in terms of security and safety, is, is that a bit of a factor in, in and of itself? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, a fifth of all Canadians live and work in rural communities and, and, you know, uh, there have been a lot of demographic and, and tech focused changes that are creating new opportunities for these communities, but also creating some disruptions that people have to adapt to. So, uh, you know, I think as you're, you're suggesting uh, in support of rural prosperity, uh, you know, the government of Canada has identified rural economic development as an important national priority. And in fact, when you look at the economic development strategy for rural Canada, it includes things like uh, achieving high-speed internet and mobile connectivity, Mm -hmm. and also developing uh, climate-resilient infrastructure, which uh, is is kind of an important element of uh, Ag 4.0 as well. And so, the, you know, we have a we have a, an important commitment to addressing the broadband issue, as you're saying. If this is resolved as, as quickly as, as many hope, uh, one of the things it could mean uh, is an accelerate, rather an accelerated embrace of, of smart farming technologies. Uh, however, you know, if these technologies are implemented uh, too quickly without attention to how the, the various components fit together within a secure, uh, you know, farm-based cyber system, the result could be, you know, what you might call smart farming that isn't always secure farming. Mm-hmm. And looking at the speed of adoption, you've you've said recently, uh, as I recall, that yeah. uh, that there's it's getting tougher for operators to keep pace with the with the rate of change in terms of mm-hmm. the potential cybersecurity threats and vulnerabilities that are out there. You know, I, I was wondering if you could expand a bit on that concern and and what farmers need to be aware of. Yeah, well, first I'd say that farmers, you know, by the nature of their work and their traditions, are really good risk managers, um, but increasingly they've got a lot to juggle. Um, mm-hmm. So then, you know, the nature, the number, and the intensity of cyber threats is evolving quickly across all sectors. You know, these are moving uh, beyond simple identity theft or data theft or ransomware attacks, although these are still very important, towards more sophisticated exploits that sometimes involve a combination of players, uh, even including nation state actors. So if you think about the recent solar wind situation down in the US, a point of entry that compromised thousands of their government departments was through the system software they all purchased from a single vendor. It's still not clear exactly what the motivations were behind that exploit and in fact what that exploit might be up to. Um, But it's likely that 
uh, some exploits that you know we've already seen and that we're going to see in the future um, really could be about more than one thing. So, for example, hacks into farm-based systems that modify data uh, can result in misleading information about livestock or crops, and that can serve a number of purposes. So, it could be mm -hmm. you know about industrial espionage, you know, disrupting inputs to control systems or, you know, uh, market manipulation, things like that. It could be about hacktivism. It could also be about international trade processes. And if you have um, things like that are, that are combined with uh, social media-based influence operations that make false claims about some aspect of the ag food system, the results there could range from, you know, derailed trade arrangement to uh, critical supply chain interruptions. So what we're starting to see is that, you know, um, increasingly, you know, uh, all sectors are facing the risk of these kinds of layered and more sophisticated exploits where they're not just one thing. They're not a, just about a bad guy stealing some data uh, that they're going to then, uh, you know, sell on the black market. It could be about that, but it could also be in, in support of some other goals that we're less aware of in that moment. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you mentioned some examples there. What, do, we, do we have any other examples of uh, sort of the vulnerabilities of the of the ag sector specifically? Yeah, you bet. And, and I would say that what we plan to do is to uh, start to uh, investigate that uh, with our project. There really hasn't been very much research on this topic to date, but what has been done is, is informative. I mean, for example, a recent set of case studies of the Finnish dairy uh, industry concluded that a, a key issue for cybersecurity there uh, was a lack of training for farm staff. Another was the lack of segregation between business computers and communications networks and uh, home computers and communication networks. So, you know, you can ex imagine a busy uh, mom and pop operation. Both parents are also working other jobs. The kids are studying at home today, certainly. Uh, mm -hmm. And they may all be using the same network uh, to do their work, to serve <clears throat> the web, to uh, communicate with their friends and family members, uh, and also to uh, to operate their their uh, their farm equipment and and conduct their business. So that was something that they identified. That's really a potential problem. There are other kinds of issues uh, that were observed, including things like you know network equipment and what people call network typology. In other words, how uh, everything is kind of configured to work together on the farm. Uh, really importantly, things like protection against malicious software or protecting endpoints. You know, you think about uh, how more and more farms are using things like uh, wireless sensor networks. Um, you know, they're not always um, able to um, ensure that all of those different connected elements of their system have the safeguards that they need to be able to do the work they need to do in a safe and secure way. Uh, so that's really important. Other things are, are kind of simple, but really important as well. Sometimes, uh, you know, video feeds aren't focusing on the right things or server cabinets can be exposed to moisture, dust, or, uh, you know, uh, interruptions by wildlife and pests. So, you know, when we think about this, we're thinking not always about malicious activities, but sometimes inadvertent things that can cause disruptions to how the system works. And of course, the biggest thing is always uh, human error, whether it's an inadvertent um, mistake that someone makes by clicking on a malicious email, forgetting to do something that's going to safeguard the integrity of equipment, uh, or, you know, in some cases, maybe a disgruntled former worker attempts to sabotage something or sell some information to a third party. So these are some of the things that we're noticing. I guess, you know, in addition to that, um, what we do know is that, uh, as, I, as I suggested, dependencies on multiple data streams with multiple points of connectivity uh, create openings uh, and vulnerabilities to attack. Um, really importantly for any business is, uh, you know, not thinking enough about risk planning that also includes things like human error and what we could call cyber hygiene. So if we think about, you know, farms are increasingly, uh, you know, corporatizing themselves, whether as a family corporation or some other corporation, just like any other business, 
uh, cybersecurity needs to be considered as part of enterprise risk management. And traditionally, it's been difficult for um, most businesses to really start to shift their perspective and shift their culture to recognize the importance of this as kind of a, a C-suite set of activities and perspectives. Farms would be no different, but they're in some ways more vulnerable and uh, that's going to be a really important thing that they can do to start to think differently. Mm -hmm. Now, the, obviously, this this project is uh, is you know still, or this campaign rather, is still in the relatively early stages. Yes. Um, what what do, what do we what do we know that we don't know uh, relative to other sectors uh, about uh, about cybersecurity and ag? Yeah, that's a really great question, Dave. And and as I alluded to uh, a few moments ago, I think one of the things that uh, I don't think we have a really good handle on yet is the speed of adoption of smart farming technologies across the country, including uh, data analytic services for decision support, as well as others. Uh, so, you know, the ag food sector here covers a really broad range of producers. It's regionally diversified. Uh, if we take an example of dairy producers, again, some may find advantages in transitioning to automated milking parlors. Other may find, uh, others may find that the cost of entry right now for them is, is too high. Uh, cattle producers may or may not move quickly to adopt wearable or implantable technology in their livestock. Uh, but by contrast, poultry operations and, and hog barns rely on environmental control systems for productivity and animal welfare. Uh, and we may see increasing integration between those and other farm-based technologies. And certainly things like vertical farms are all about the application of new sensor analytic and control system technology. So this is something to, to really uh, sort of uh, think about and keep our eye on as well. Even if some groups of primary producers don't embrace smart farming technologies as quickly as others, their supply chains may have critical pinch points enabled by technology. For example, uh, you know, small-scale cattle producers may not feel they need to move quickly in this direction, but the much smaller number of finishing operations are already there, and technology is a feature of the concentrated number of processing operations in Canada. So if we focus only on the producer level, we might miss important vulnerabilities associated with tech-enabled elements of a particular supply chain. And I guess finally, some uh, sub-tech sectors digitalize more rapidly than others. Uh, and as a result, they're, they can lead the way in navigating that minefield of cyber threats. This is why collective learning and dialogue is going to be so important here. Mm -hmm. And which dovetails nicely into my next question: um, What would what would the CSKA like to see in terms of uh, of farmer participation in this project? Yeah, so over the coming year, uh, we'll begin reaching out to producers and industry sector representatives to begin this all important learning and dialogue process. We're going to be taking a variety of approaches here, including direct engagement with the ag food sector through conversations, focus groups, and a survey, as well as ongoing collaboration to develop and assess a set of resources that they can use to strengthen their cybersecurity position, you know, speaking in a language that's meaningful to them, reflecting back their lived experience to them in ways that are understandable and accessible. Additionally, some of our great colleagues over at the University of Guelph's Food for Thought Initiative will be releasing, releasing a, a nationwide survey shortly with Stratus Ag Research, and they're focusing on getting farmer perspectives about digital technology use and agri-food data governance with a bit about cybersecurity as well. So they're going to use their survey findings to inform the development of an app to help farmers monitor their ag devices to prevent hacking. Uh, and we have a nice working relationship with them over there. So both of our groups can work collaboratively to bring value to the Canadian ag food sector. At the end of the day, we hope farmers will feel welcome to participate in our learning and development process. Uh, and invite them to start thinking about what they want us to know and what they feel they need to know. We'll be reaching out in the next coming months for sure. Mm -hmm. And and by the time this uh, this this project and this campaign is 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 completed, what what can Canadian farmers hope to see coming coming out of coming out the other end of this? 
Yeah, so they'll see uh, that, you know, they were engaged and listened to about their understandings and requirements related to cybersecurity. Uh, you know, they'll see understandable, useful, non-technical resources were developed in consultation with them based on their needs. We should see a greater level of collective awareness and engagement, uh, you know, including among industry, policy, public safety, and national security. And then lastly, related to that, um, you know, we should see momentum towards mutual aid, public-private dialogue to strengthen cybersecurity and resilience at both, you know, local and national levels. We're really all in this together. And as I mentioned earlier, because um, increasingly these cyber exploits are about more than one thing and can involve nation state actors, uh, you know, it's about everybody working together, sharing knowledge and learnings, thinking from more of a collective defense perspective and, uh, you know, having dialogue conversations uh, and uh, cooperation uh, between themselves, but also between uh, other critical infrastructures, as well as public safety and national security uh, actors. Those are the kinds of things that are going to build collective capacity uh, and be more sustainable and more effective in the long term. And with all that in mind, I'm I'm already feeling considerably less terrified than when you were listing off the, <laughs> the risks to the uh, to the sector. Uh, we'll certainly be watching for uh, for more information and uh, for for more outreach from the uh, CSKA in the uh, very near future. Doctor Doctor Boschner, thank you very much for your time today. My great pleasure, Dave. Thanks so much for your interest, and I look forward to uh, keeping you up to date as we go forward with this. Look forward to hearing more. Dr. Janosch Bochner is the lead investigator with the Community Safety Knowledge Alliance in Guelph. You're listening to Between the Rows. I'm your host this week, Dave Bedard. Well, it's Tuesday afternoon as we speak, and Statistics Canada this morning released its first estimates for principal field crop areas for this spring. So where do Canadian grain markets go from here? That's why we've got Bruce Burnett, the Director of Weather and Markets for Glacier Markets Farm on the line. Bruce, hi, and uh, welcome back to Between the Rows. Good to be here. So it uh, looks like we're going to see canola acres increase this year, but not by as much as the canola trade was expecting. So uh, if I'm new crop canola values, what do I take from this? Well, certainly I think it's a concern because of the fact that uh, the acreage only increased about 750,000 acres from last year to 21.5 million acres, which again is a lot of canola area. It's uh, but uh, it isn't enough uh, because of the fact that we've seen such strong demand for canola and it's the reason prices are as high as they are. Uh, but it does make it a challenge for next year, um, especially if we don't get average to above average yields uh, in order to uh, supply all the customers and to crush as much canola as we would like to um, in Canada here. So, I think again, it's it's uh, going to support new crop uh, uh, values um, as we uh, move through the spring season here. Certainly, um, this report I, I think also uh, really emphasized uh, that there is uh, more than one crop out there that uh, the farmers are looking to uh, uh, plant this year because of the high prices for virtually all the commodities. Mm hmm. Um, I noticed uh, barley acres, of course, they were up, but that wasn't a, that wasn't an entirely unexpected development either, was it? No, it wasn't. But the, the barley area was uh, uh, quite a bit stronger, I think, than people were expecting up over mm -hmm. a million acres. Uh, again, <laughs> I think the demand for barley is uh, 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 is going to be strong this year. And it's one of the reasons why the canola area probably didn't increase as much as uh, people thought it would. Um, Again, the footprint for barley and canola are virtually the same, uh, mostly in the northern growing areas of the prairies. Uh, uh, so uh, basically farmers uh, have decided that they're going to plant uh, barley as well as the canola. And that kept the canola area from increasing uh, uh, maybe even larger than it did. Mm -hmm. Now, I was I was interested to see there was a, there was a bit of an uptake in uh, soybean acres as well. I mean, was was that a surprise to anybody? Well, I think, again, soybeans uh, uh, have a, a unique advantage. Uh, first of all, uh, again, they're an oil seed, so they've been priced relatively highly this year. Um, uh, and then uh, if you combine that with the fact that it 
doesn't require as much in the way of inputs, certainly nitrogen fertilizer, uh, uh, especially uh, that has become quite costly this spring. Uh, it certainly gives them the soybeans a bit of an advantage there uh, in terms of the uh, uh, of the cost uh, of production. So uh, I think it wasn't uh, it was anticipated that we see a, an increase in the soybean area. So uh, uh, and we managed to pick up close to three hundred thousand acres across Canada. Mm-hmm. So um, unless we've got some new acres hidden under the couch cushion somewhere, well, which which crops are going to take the hit this spring? Well, I think uh, the crop that you saw the largest drop uh, certainly was spring wheat. Um, yes. We're down about 8.8% from last year uh, and about 1.6 million acres uh, 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 were were not or are going to be planted to other crops this year. So that uh, wasn't um, unexpected. We, we expected the spring wheat area to go down. It was probably a little bit larger uh, than... I personally thought um, just because the spring wheat prices have rallied here uh, as we've gone through the second half of the marketing year. And uh, it it certainly uh, does compare well favorably uh, as a uh, part of the rotation. So uh, uh, that was uh, maybe a bit of a surprise. But again, given the fact that we had increased the barley area, I think there was no place for spring wheat to go but down unfortunately, in this report. Did, uh, did the grain trade really see it? I mean, you, you'd, you'd said, though, that it was, um, that it was the, you know, a bit, bit more than you would have expected, but did the, uh, was it sort of, sort of in line with what the grain trade had been seeing or had been, had been expecting, rather? Yeah, it was, cl- it was pretty close to what people were expecting, probably on the low side of the estimates, if you were to um, uh, look at the, look at the, the, the pre-report estimates. Um, I think the thing is, is that the, Acreage reduction uh, was significantly higher than it was even south of uh, the U.S. border. Again, the U.S. area declined about four to five percent uh, in sort of the traditional spring wheat areas that we think of in the northern plains. So uh, we <clears throat> saw even more pressure there. I think in the U.S. they anticipate that that area is going to drop, so maybe it will be closer on a percentage basis to the Canadian. Uh, drop in area as well. Mm-hmm. So uh, just uh, granted, it's it's still only Tuesday. By the time this comes out, it'll be Thursday. But um, do we do we know yet? Uh, what what do we know about how the uh, how the markets have responded? Just uh, with the with the news coming out this morning. Well, certainly with these numbers, you would anticipate that the canola and spring wheat markets, the Minneapolis futures market, would go higher uh, today. Uh, we actually ended up finish finishing lower to. Uh, I would say wheat was a little bit more unchanged today. Uh, I, I think overall, uh, in the longer term, this does support the new crop contracts for both spring wheat and canola. Um, the canola market in particular has a very uh, big inverse working between old and new crop right now. And uh, given that the crop uh, uh, does have uh, some dryness concerns for canola for new crop, as well as this lower area, I think uh, um, uh, that should support uh, the deferred contracts a little bit more than than they have been, let's say, up to this point in time. Um, it, with average yields, uh, and if we do just plant this area that uh, is is forecast by Statistics Canada, we're going to have a very tough time in maintaining uh, our exports. Uh, anywhere close to what last year's exports were. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned dryness concerns. And of course, this wouldn't be a farming podcast if we didn't talk about the weather. You know, uh, here in Winnipeg, I I only just noticed the last of the snow pile I shoveled away from the back gate is gone and the yard's already pretty dusty. I mean, what are are we seeing out there as far as uh, growing conditions, you know, heading into seeding? Well, uh, again, uh, we did get some snow, especially in the eastern sides of the prairies. uh, the areas that did pick up uh, significant precipitation was sort of uh, in eastern Manitoba as well as uh, parts of eastern Saskatchewan. But uh, the remaining areas didn't pick up an awful lot in terms of measurable precipitation. Um, and, and certainly, uh, I think you can say for most of the prairies uh, south of the, the 
uh, number one highway and even in a lot of central growing areas um, uh, dry conditions still persist here so um, we do have uh, 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 some beneficial moisture here to get the crops uh, started but we certainly would like to see a general rain uh, this spring as we move into the planting season uh, of course we're already planting in some of the southern areas of the prairies and uh, that planting progress is going to move uh, into the central and northern regions here over the next uh, week to 10 days here. So uh, certainly would like to see some uh, moderate amounts of rainfall here um, over the next two <coughs> to three weeks just to help get these crops uh, germinated uh, properly and support some early season growth. Yeah, I haven't checked the forecast since yesterday. Is there uh, is there anything like that on the horizon? Um, th there's nothing right now on the horizon in terms of general precipitation across the prairies. Uh, there are a series of small di disturbances that will bring some scattered light precipitation. And uh, again, if you're under those showers, it's wonderful, but uh, those aren't nearly extensive enough to give us the amount of moisture that we need to help start and improve our soil moisture conditions. Mm -hmm. So we'll be watching the skies as well as the markets. Bruce, thanks very much for your time today. Thank you. Bruce Burnett is Director of Weather and Markets with Glacier Markets Farm. That's our episode for the week. Many, many thanks, of course, to Bruce and to Dr. Janosz Bochner for sharing their time with us. And we'll be back in a week with more from the Glacier Farm Media family of publications. You've been listening to Between the Rows, and I've been your host this week, Dave Bedard. Thanks for listening. Thanks for calling the crop guru. Yeah, I'm wondering about increasing yield and return with optimal P and K applications. Oh, uh, reply hazy, try again. Okay, I also need a nutrient removal calculator. Cannot predict now. Hold on, are you using a magic eight ball? Uh, signs point to yes. Get less guessing and more data. Expert research, advice, and soil management tools are available for free at Nutrien Economics. That's nutrien-economics.com.